I'd like to welcome a friend, an FWE champion. She flew to Prince George even in British Columbia last fall for the One Day E-Series there and changed many people's lives. Former VP of Starbucks who helped grow the company with Starbucks CEO Howard Schultz from 1986 onwards. Then CEO at Lululemon, grew sales 350% in five years, transformed the business into the world's most profitable retail apparel company. And then you'd think she'd be done, but no, she did what all smart people do. She became an entrepreneur, and now she's turning the frozen food industry on its head, being the CEO of Luvo and distributing in 6,000 retailers in the US, including on Delta flights. She's a mother, she's an innovator, she's a friend of FWE. Please welcome Christine Day. Thank you, Christina. It's a, a pleasure to be here and, uh, and join, you, join you once more. And Prince George was lovely, by the way. Um, I'd never been there before. Uh, and that shows you how the power of persuasion that Christina when she asks you to do something, you find yourself on little planes or, you know, I have to head back tonight, even just getting here um, late last night, uh, because it meant so much to me to help Christina with this amazing program that she has started that I think really makes a difference. And it's worth um, every moment that I've put into being here today. And I hope you'll feel that way um, after my talk. What I want to speak to you today about, I mean, there's so many things that I'm going to try and cram like 30 years of experience into 15 minutes um, that I'd like to talk about. But I think, you know, I've had a, an opportunity to participate in some great companies. You know, um, Starbucks, the, the story there was I actually started with Howard at Il Giornale, and my first job was to help him raise the money um, to grow the company and uh, took on an operating role at the same time. And there was one store, and revenue was about 400000 for the whole year. And when I left, it was a $7 billion company, and I was running 10 countries in Asia. So it was an incredible um, journey, and I learned so many things there. Then I took a year off, um, because I have three children, and I want to spend a little time at home. And uh, then I started at Lululemon, and that was about um, just under $200 million, and uh, was $1.6 billion when I left um, after six years. So I've learned a lot about growth, but I've also learned a lot about market disruption. And so, you know, one of the questions I get asked a lot is, did you just get lucky or did you see something? And so what the first thing I want to talk a little bit about is, is recognizing good ideas and, and what is it that I see in the marketplace and how have these companies come together to be so powerful in the marketplace? And uh, before I go there, I want to talk a little bit about what we're doing at Luvo. So um, my personal experience is my uh, mother has suffered from diabetes due to an illness that she had in her early 50s for a little over 20 years. And she recently lost her uh, lower left leg due to diabetes complications, has kidney issues. So I had to help my dad find food for my mom to cook for her because they're by themselves. And uh, my dad was now taking on a lot more of the cooking, but I also had to be really sensitive to what my mom could eat. And um, the reality was I couldn't find much. And my dad's not much of a cook, unless it's on a barbecue. So you know, finding healthy meals, I realized as I was walking through the grocery stores, you know, the organic is not enough, because it's actually very poor in nutrition in a lot of cases, and has high sodium, has um, high sugar rates, which is you know, really bad, very low in protein, the right, not the right combination of foods if you're a nutritionist. So I happened across a small um, food company that had a great purpose, but um, was very much struggling in, in, and uh, not probably going to make it. And it was probably in a lot worse shape than I thought when I took it on. So I took on that small company and changed the focus of every meal we did to perfect nutrition and affordable. And so I recognized standing in the grocery store that there were about 200 items that could be redeveloped to a healthy profile based off of nutrition and be 70 to 80% organic and have um, antibiotic and hormone free beef um, and that could be affordable and not served in plastic trays because everything we do is served in a paper pouch. So, um, you know, it was a, it's a steam method of cooking, which also can be put in the oven so you don't have to microwave it. So that was disruptive on one level, but that wasn't enough um, for me to keep it um, interesting. So I wanted to change the whole way foods brought to market. So we've partnered up with um, some substantial farms in the U.S., and we're still completing some additional deals, which will ultimately bring us into Canada. 
But what we've done is we've moved dehydrators um, out to farms because in the farming community, only about 50% of the produce actually makes the market. In fact, McLean's just spoke about this in an article this month um, that's just recently out about the amount of food waste um, at farms. And it's too expensive to ship it. So what we do is we dehydrate it there into flakes or semi-dehydrated pieces. Now that saves water, it saves energy, it reduces the cost, um, and it brings the most nutritious, actually, food to the marketplace and the most flavorful. And then we take those crystals or semi-dehydrated pieces and make um, the sauces and um, the ingredients which make our product more flavorful, reduce the sodium levels, and, um, and uh, really preserves the whole economic cycle of sustainability. And then we're just now taking the um, uh, pressed juice pulp remains from juice companies, which is all the fruit um, and vegetables as well, and making that in. So it's reclaiming food in the cycle to make food more abundant. And at the same time, and then food can be affordable, um, but it's all organic um, food, which everybody is seeking and chasing. So disrupting the whole cycle is what we're up to while we're manufacturing great tasting food. So we're currently in about 5,000 uh, grocery stores in the US, and we just launched in Vancouver um, this last week, and we'll probably be in the Toronto market by um, July. So that's what we're up to at Luvo. So. And when I started there, the sales were, um, you know, just under a million dollars, I think, for the product. And people said, you know, why did you start in, you know, in something that small? You could have done anything. And my response was, the growth is all ahead of me. So if you're somebody who loves to grow businesses, small doesn't scare you um, because you see the future that's all the way in front. So what is it I've learned um, about building these great companies and, and seeing? The first is that your company has to have great purpose. So people don't come to work for you as a job. They actually come to work for the mission of your company. And when you get them to work for the mission of your company, then they believe. And work doesn't feel like work. They get up coming in every day to be a part of the journey and to make a difference in what it is that you're up to. And that's a common thread about Starbucks, which was you know, creating the third place and sustainability in the coffee farms. And being really clear and articulate in the purpose and values of your company is what engages your workforce. It attracts people who are there for the mission of your company, not just to have a job or be there based on pay. So if you're going to attract great people and have a story that changes the social narrative, you've got to have a great purpose and be with great values. And that's a common thread. So what I'm always looking for is what's the purpose? What, what is it that I can create that's different than what's here before, what's needed in a way that declares a powerful purpose that not only my employees but my consumers are engaged with? The second is you need great differentiation. So when you look at Starbucks, um, you know at the time, you know coffee was commoditized and it was you know 50 cents a cup, and um, and people had forgotten what good coffee was. So creating great coffee and bringing it to the third place and having a place where people could gather uh, together again as a sense of community brought social values um, and the consistency and quality and the customization that Starbucks brought was also great differentiation. So what was different from getting just a black cup of coffee was customization. So getting a double tall, extra hot, half sweet, no whip mocha anytime you wanted it, anywhere you wanted it had high value. And so that ability to create something that's truly differentiated and unique in the marketplace. And at Lululemon, what happened was we brought the mindset of yoga um, to the athletic world. But we also, the purpose was also to help build more yoga studios and our work with ambassadors, um, creating more yoga for people to go to, created more market. So we weren't selling product, we were making a market with the work that we did with our ambassadors. And trusting that we knew our job well enough, but to create bringing fashion into athletic clothes, you know, women did not want to, in their 30s, look like they're wearing their soccer uniform to the coffee shop. And then bringing the retail experience, so no longer shopping at Dick's Sporting Goods um, or Sports Authority or you know, the, the local sporting chain where they have no dressing fit rooms. And if they did have them, they were filled with shoes. And if you didn't have the bra size you wanted, um, you had to ask the guy um, who was taking care of shoes to go get you another one, and he'd look at you with that blank expression. 
So bringing the retail shopping experience to athletic wear um, and bringing that yoga mindset, which was a purpose people wanted to believe in, and actually designing clothes into what women did instead of soccer, football, which I recognize some people do do those things, or rugby or hockey, um, most of us go to the gym. So we actually designed for what the market was. So those differentiation points, and at Luvo, recognizing that nutrition is the unsaid conversation that's most needed um, in the marketplace, so we're not eating empty calories. That differentiation um, and understanding how to create a story around that in the marketplace that you're first in is critical to building a great business. The next thing that I look at is great knowledge. So, you know, I am an idea person and a strategist, but I also believe in knowing the field that you're playing in. And examples that I give is, I, you know, of my, of my boys, um, one is a car fanatic. He knows everything there is around cars. So when we go to buy a car, I bring him with me, and it's really funny to watch the salesperson in the end of the beginning of the conversation. They're talking to me, and about five minutes later, they're talking to my, at the time, 12-year-old who's negotiating for my Lexus. So, because he knew cars, and, and it's his passion, and he's really good at it. My older son is, you know, all about sports. He's a walking, you know, ESPN. And so he knows sports so well. At eight, he won the sports trivia contest on a cruise in, in the bar. You know, that's like who he is. He's talking sports. And if you know your business with that level of passion, you know, then you know the playing field, you know who your competition is, and it's just like breathing to you because, you know, you have that great knowledge of the industry you're in, reading about it, working in it, you know, it's connected to that passion, but you have to know the playing field and you have to know who your competition is and you have to be interested in that. So think of it always as knowing your ESPN facts. Do you know that about your business? Great ideas often fail, and Christina, I think in your, your talk, talked about like 50% of entrepreneurial adventures don't make it. Um, you have to be able to scale with impact in your business, and that takes great discipline, which is the other thing I've really learned to do. So I know what metrics matter in my business, both strategically and operationally, and I make sure that when I do my planning, that I'm planning not only for what has to happen today, but what has to happen for the future. I call this the two bridge analogy. So there's a lot of congestion on the bridge I have today, but if I only fix that, instead of building my bridge for the future, I wouldn't be able to live my purpose for the organization. So I'm always planning on two horizons for the businesses that I'm in, so that I'm managing for the long term and the short term issues that we've got. And I know what metrics matter, and we talk about them weekly. So great team, I think you guys all know about that. Um, but I want to share a few lessons about what I've learned about being um, a leader since we're going to run out of time. So um, there's so many other things I could talk about. But you know, one thing I've learned about being a leader is you already are one. And you probably just don't express it in all the ways um, that you could. And that each of us has unique leadership characteristics. And everything that's happened in our lives has shaped us to be that leader that we are today. All the good times, all the bad times actually create your leadership platform. And you can't be somebody else's. You can only be your own. So it's that ability to look inside yourself and, and define leadership. So for me, I define leadership in two ways. One is creating a future that would not otherwise occur. And if you think about all the companies that I've worked for that are vision and purpose led, um, I'm about creating a future like food, uh, you know, redefining the food supply chain and reinventing CPG companies. That's a future that would not otherwise occur. Um, and then the other second part is creating the space for others to perform. So if you create the space for others to perform, you're not doing everything yourself. It's about having that great team. It's about coaching. It's about setting clear objectives. It's about resource management. It's about taking risks and choosing the risks you're going to manage, because I'll assure you at the top, there are not perfect solutions. Those got made um, farther down the organization than I ever got to. So the other thing that's really important is knowing yourself. And knowing your journey and story as a leader and what is it that you bring in your strengths. And the second is knowing impact that you have on other people. Like I have a very definite style. I'm a team um, player. I like to run a team as, as an organization. 
So I'm not a very, um, I am directive in the outcomes I want from a strategic perspective, but I'm not gonna be as hands-on. So I need players who like to play in their own space and be part of a team. So knowing how I work and the impact of my style on other people is part of what helps build high performance teams. You know, we've talked a little bit about passion and we've talked about um, you know, being yourself a little bit. And the one thing that I've learned in my whole life from the time I was a very little girl is that I've always been different. And I've been really happy to be different. And that's probably what's made me the most different, is I haven't felt this need to conform um, or to be what people expect me to be. And from a very early age, you know, my mother would tell you that was very, very true. And the beautiful thing my parents gave me was to not live a life of comparison, or I got to live a life of being me, and I know that gave me the confidence in my, in my future um, to express myself and my capabilities in a way um, that didn't put me in a box. And that mattered, and that is the hugest gift that you can give someone, whether it's your child or a student or a colleague at work, is giving them that room to be all of their strengths Forgive them the things that they're probably not as good at and find ways to bring teams together that are compatible because you can't be other people. You know, I think Oscar Wilde said it best when he said, be yourself, everyone else is taken. And, you know, I, I've, and learning to lead from this place inside yourself is critical. The other things are, you know, hard work is a talent too. When people say to me, what is your greatest talent? I would probably tell you it's I work hard. And I work hard at relationships as much as I work um, at my work. So I tell people, you know, when it work for me, you know, problems are what we come to resolve every day, opportunities what we come to pursue, and relationships what allows us to do both against the purpose of the organization. So you have to manage all of those dimensions as a leader. And being bold is also really important. But the thing I found, you know, is if you're not bold, then you'll be standing around the water cooler talking about the person who is. And I'd rather be the person who took that chance and that opportunity um, than be the one who stood idly by. And then the other thing is being your own disruptor. You know, when he, I've already shared the stories in the beginning about how I look at markets, I'm not afraid to, to operate in the space as a leader that's not analyzed and known. So the thing about doing something different is it's never been done before and therefore cannot be measured. You have to move into your strategy and be confident of the innovation in the site you see it and use your skills to build the scale behind it. You can't measure what doesn't exist yet. You can only say, what would it take to win? So I know I've won in this nutrition, I think if I can create 200 SKUs that have been reinvented, accepted by the consumer, and then I'll have a billion dollar company. So I can't look at analytical and sales of what doesn't exist. I have to create a goal for the future to say this is what that market opportunity looks like. And so the last couple of pieces of advice um, is the other piece is about yourself as a person. And I find it's far more, um, as a leader, being humble is so important. And the difference is that we're accomplished, but we're not any more important than anyone else. And so you can be proud of your accomplishments, but they are not who you are. They are only what you've done. So to be a real leader to people, you have to see the people that you're working with and that are working for you, and you have to create the same type of environment for them that you'd want for yourself. And you know, at the end of it, um, sometimes you have to call your own game, because not you can't be the leader that you want to be. Um, everywhere and you have to know when it's your time and I recognize that at Starbucks and I recognize that um, at Lululemon and you know so sometimes you the power of choice is also the biggest power you have as a leader and leading your own personal journey and staying in your values so those are the things that that I've really learned over my 30 years and there's so much more I could tell you but I think we have generous time for question and answers or conversations um, so if there's anything that you'd like to talk about, um, I'm really open to that. But I just want to thank Christina for giving me the opportunity to share a little bit about market disruption and the leadership journey that I've had. Mm -hmm.